surprise to anybody, but we just have to read them and just bring honor to the Lord today. Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house yes. of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Psalm 127. That's it. Phones in the basket. Psalm 127, <laughs> verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. All right. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And probably should have maybe read this one before we started the music, but that's okay. Because I'll need some people, some amens and stuff throughout the service. It's very quiet in here. <laughs> Can't hear the kids. <laughs> the echoes in my own mind in here. <laughs> Psalm 150. So next time, next Sabbath when we come back and the music's playing, guys, just think about this. Uh, there's there's nobody next door. There's no one right there you're going to disturb. All right. Guys, we've been waiting for this for yeah. a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. We've been waiting for a place where we can let loose a little louder, Hallelujah. sing a little longer, Amen. maybe move around a little bit Woo! without putting an elbow in your neighbor's eye. <laughs> All right? So just remember, David wrote it, not me. Amen. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Yeah. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Yeah. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Yeah. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Yeah. Yeah. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Yeah. People that say you don't need instruments in church, yeah. they didn't read all the verses I've read. Right. They don't get it. <clears throat> Praise Him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and the dance. All right. It means you don't have to sit down. Come on. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Yep. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. And then if you don't have any of those things, All right. let everything that has breath. Oh, Guys, I just want to just say, uh, I think, I would just like to say thank you to uh, the uh, the leadership of the, of the church we're written from for um, working with Elder Logan this week and opening up a portion of their, uh, their facilities to allow us to use to bring glory to our King, our Savior, and uh, to allow us to meet here and to uh, give us a very fair... Um, Fair deal, yeah. And uh, we are very thankful to uh, yes. Pastor Ken and uh, and all those uh, that attend here the house. Precious. And um, I just pray the Lord bless them for that. Amen. Yes. And uh, how about just one more time before I get started and before the Lord starts through me? Let's just give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> The Lord truly is good. I'm quite overwhelmed. Uh, out of my depth a little bit here today. I'm not used to tables and looking out at people. I'm used to being yeah. down. So if I come out and walk around, I'm just trying to get comfortable. Amen. Do it, bro. Um, you want me to hand them off? Yeah, Elder. Um, just don't walk out in the hallway. Brother Jeff, if you can just pass this out. I'm not promising to stay on script, but I might. <laughs> so... Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. It's a good to gather on His Sabbath day in His presence with His people. For those that are of like mind, one accord, in His presence. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. My son made me... <clears throat> Give him a title or that. No idea what to call this. So we'll just go with what the end of this, the message is about today, and just call it "Hold Back Your Hand." All right. Okay. You could also say "Bite Your Tongue." Mm. Okay. Either one of those will work. Hallelujah. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. How many know it's important? 
when we're building anything that we lay a solid foundation. Amen. 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 Uh, whether it's a physical building or a spiritual house, right? We have to make sure the foundation is sound and sure. Right. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> but how many know that once you get the walls up and get the basic primer on there, that it's okay to move beyond the basic structure of the house and begin to fill it, all right, and grow the house into something beautiful. And if I can use the word for where I'm going, mature. Okay. So the message today, the beginning of it's going to be about laying a foundation. The middle of it's going to be about where we find that foundation. And the end of it will just be a small lesson in this day and age for us to uh, help us in our uh, maturing process. Amen. Okay. So if we can, if we can all start with the uh, what's become one of my favorite uh, passages of scripture in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 through chapter 6 verse 3 it says for when for the time you ought to be teachers you have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. All right. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Everybody say perfection. 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 Everybody just say maturity. Maturity. It's probably a better English word for it in this day and age because perfection denotes something in some people's mind that leads them to condemn themselves for every small mistake That's it. instead of just taking it for what it is, which is part of the growing process. That's the truth. Amen. Okay. So let us go on unto perfection. And that was almost the title of the message, Onto Perfection. Not laying again the foundation. What is the foundation? Of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Every pastor's favorite three words, if God permit. All right. Hallelujah. I want to start, uh, just stay here in this uh, this passage of Scripture for just a second. I, I do want to point out a few things. One, the context shows that they had already been taught the basic principles of Christ. Right. They said, let's let, not lay it again. Okay. Two, he talks about how when you have the meat... That that's how you build a discernment. Okay? You have to know the Word. I know Elder Logan and I have talked about this before. Some people say, oh, I need the gift of discernment. And there is a spiritual gift of discernment. But much of that gift is helped along if you study the Word, Amen. pray the Word, and learn the Word. Amen. You can't have discernment if you don't know the Word. Right. Okay. Right. So part of that is you exercise your senses through knowing the Word front to back and back to front and everything in the middle so that when things are preached, things are taught, you see things just in your day-to-day -day life, that you can discern whether that lines up with the Word of God as Amen. good Amen. or evil. Right. And in this day, it's very important to know the difference. Amen. Also, it's telling to look at some of the things that Paul says are milk, basic doctrines. I would argue in most modern churches, many of these things aren't taught at all and are very little understood. All right. Okay. But look at repentance from dead works. How many have heard it said, and if you haven't, don't raise your hand, but raise your hand if you've heard <laughs> baptism described as a dead work. Who's heard? Who's heard? I heard it. 
You don't have to be baptized. That's just a work. You're just trying to earn your way. You're right. Show of hands. Amen. Use some turn out. Make sure I'm not crazy. Amen. Okay. Now that's funny. They say we're supposed to repent from dead works. Read a couple phrases later. The doctrine of baptisms. All right. How in the world does that one get by the church? Yeah. People falsely say, oh, you don't have to get baptized. You don't, you know, it's, you know, you want to, that's fine, but it's just a work. You don't have to get baptized. You're trying to earn salvation. Give me a break, guys. It's right there. He says, and of the doctrine of baptism. He says that's a milk issue. That's a basic foundational right. doctrine of Christ. He's Amen. Baptized in his name. That's the truth. Also, a better way to translate repentance from dead works is repentance from works that lead to death. And if I did another study, those works, if I can just say it right now and get off of it, the works that lead to death are sin. Right. Right? right. Works that lead to death are sin. Okay, the works of the flesh, as Paul would say in Romans. Laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. Those are all, there's six basic doctrines pointed out in the book of Hebrews. Today I'm going to touch on the laying on of hands a little bit uh, towards the end. But if we can, because we like to lay a foundation using the whole word, let's go to Isaiah 28, 16. And let's identify what our foundation is. Isaiah 28 and 16 says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believes shall not make haste. And I'll just throw another one out there for free right now. Those last four words. Guys, it's not a sprint. This walk we're on, do not get in a hurry. That doesn't mean sit at home on a couch. It just means right. don't rush. Right. Learn. Right. Exactly. Okay, walk. So right. walk with God. You can run at times. Time. But guys, this isn't a 100-yard sprint. Right. You know, it's not like sprint to the baptismal, get filled with the Holy Ghost. Woo, I made it. Two services. I'm done. Right. No, guys. No. No. Those that believe shall not make Haste. Amen. Pace yourself in God. Right. Amen. That does, like I said, doesn't mean put it in park. <laughs> but it also means don't go six thousand RPMs either. Right. Right. Okay. Nothing find. Wrong with that. You gotta find. Oh. Find a pace with God. Grow with God in grace. Okay. All right. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Amen. All right. Amen. Let's build on that. So we've identified there's a stone. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Let's go a little deeper. Now I'm about to touch on something. I, I went back and forth on whether to include this or not, but I'm going to just for the sake of preventative medicine. Because we've already identified in Hebrews, and it's very funny that the writer of Hebrews and Paul here in 1 Corinthians, they talk about the reason why they hadn't moved on to meet. But give two different reasons. The writer of Hebrews says, you haven't moved on to me because you still got to learn some basics. Mm -hmm. Listen to what Paul says is another reason, or the writer of Hebrews, uh, yeah, what Paul says in Corinthians is another reason why you may not lay hold of the deeper things of God. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. Sounds very similar to, to that Hebrews verse, right? Mm -hmm. But as unto carnal even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto, that means up to this point, you were not able to bear it. Neither yet, now are you able. For you are yet carnal. Uh -oh. For whereas there is among you envying, envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, <laughs> Are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop right there. This is the point. Guys, Yeshua and his ministry, and, and God in many cases, sent disciples out and apostles out two by two. Yeah. Okay? 
Let there be no divisions among us. Come on. Let there never be, I'm just going to say it plain, never, never let it be said here, well, John baptized me. Yeah. You know, Elder Wallace preached the message that I got, you know, convicted and got baptized or got the Holy Ghost. No, sir. No, man. That doesn't fly in God's house. No. We're just vessels just like you guys are. Amen. Amen. And what had happened here in Corinthians is exactly what I just described. They started having their little favorite preacher, if I can say it that way. <laughs> okay? They all had their favorite elder, their favorite apostle, their favorite baptizer. And Paul says in another place, I baptized nobody save these two or three yeah. people. If anybody else, I don't remember. That's basically what he said, right, in modern English? <clears throat> guys, it's just, uh, we don't have this problem here, but may never be said that we have that problem Amen. here. Amen. Right. Okay? Whoever is up here, and whether it's the, either one, Elder Logan or myself, or someone else up here teaching, it's the Holy Ghost through us Amen. that yeah. brings forth the Word with power. Come on. Yes. Amen. Anything Amen. other than that is immaturity. Period. Amen. Right now, this first day in this new place, I'd quite rather refer <laughs> to the other elder, but he didn't get a peek at the notes, so I'll keep going. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Everybody with me? Amen. So we got two things that will hinder the development of of maturity in the church as individual believers specifically. One is that you don't study and you don't know the word, so you're still struggling with, you know, oh, what is repentance? Uh, what is baptism all about? Okay, that's one thing. The other thing is you're sitting there making clicks, uh -oh. making little groups, groupies. Uh -oh. Okay? Don't do either one of them in the house of God. Mm -hmm. Don't do them in real life either. <laughs> Verse 7, so then neither is he that planteth anything, nor he that watereth, but God gives the increase. Now, he that plants and he that waters are one. All right. We're one, guys. Yep. We're one body and one mind and one accord and one faith, one baptism, yep. serving one Lord. All right. Okay. Anytime there's two, we're in trouble. <laughs> For we are laborers together. I think I skipped down to verse 9. That's fine. With God, you are God's husbandry. You are God's building. Oh. Husbandry means like a vineyard. For those of the King James language there. So that's he's saying you're, you're the vineyard of God. But many times people are described as trees in the word, right? Mm -hmm. You got to be pruned, bring forth fruit, etc. And we're a house. We're supposed to be swept clean and furnished with the Holy Ghost so that nothing else can come in. All right. That's another scripture. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereon. Mm -hmm. I know if Elder Logan is anything like myself, I take coming up here very seriously and almost tremble at the responsibility. Amen. Amen. That's the truth. Okay? Amen. Uh, I try to take lots of heed how I build on... The foundation God has laid in every one of your lives through various preachers and uh, experiences. Verse 11, For the foundation can no man lay, here we're getting to it, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's skip over to Ephesians. Tie it all together. Let's start picking up the pace. Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. Ephesians 2, verse 19 says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens All right. with the saints and of the household of God. Thank you, Lord. I don't know everybody's background here. But guys, when you get baptized, when you repent and get baptized, get filled with the Holy Ghost, you are no longer uh, a Gentile, if you will. You become adopted in, grafted in Amen. to the Israel of God. Amen. Amen. That's the truth. Then all the promises of God... And the responsibility of his children falls on each and every one of us mm -hmm. and falls to each and every one of us. That's right. Verse 20. Now that we're in the household of God, we are built upon the foundation of who? The apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Before I get to the next verse, so right now you're thinking, okay, this is the temple collectively, right? Now watch the next verse. In whom you also are built together for inhabitation of God through the Spirit. <clears throat> Guys, each of us individually is a small temple of God. Amen. Full of His Spirit, walking around in the earth. 
Amen. Let's go back and uh, confirm that. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If we read carefully the Word and put things together, it's amazing. It all lines up beautifully. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Wow. Help us, Lord. Yeah, help us, Jesus. Yes. Guys, those are, that, that series of verses, when you jump from verse uh, 10 and 11 of 1 Corinthians 3 over to Ephesians and then back again to verse 16, it paints a very clear picture. We have been built upon the foundation of Yeshua, our Messiah, and built on that foundation, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We are the temple of God. Amen. And collectively, we are the temple of God. Right. So individually and collectively, we are supposed to house the Spirit Amen. of God. Amen. And that's why when we come in here, we should be praising, worshiping, and, and just inviting the Spirit yes. to move Amen. in us, through us, and amongst us because yes. this is the temple of God. Yes, it is. We don't have to get plane tickets and go anywhere. <laughs> Amen. 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 It's a huge. It's a huge uh, responsibility. Because notice what he says. He says, uh, "The Spirit of God dwelling in any man defile the temple of God." It's just. It's. It's a very sobering scripture. Yes, it is. Very sobering. Let's go to Luke six, verse forty-six. Brings a little more power to it now that we've got the background. We all learned this growing up, probably when we were knee high to a grasshopper. This is one of everybody's favorite New Testament Bible stories that doesn't involve a whale or walls falling down. Get in the right spot. Yes. Luke 6 46. And why call you me Lord? Or Lord, Lord. And do not the things which I say. Dude, they didn't teach that part. What's, uh, whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built his house and digs deep and lays the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. If I can use a little liberty, upon the rock. Yeah. Okay? And that rock is Christ. Yep. But notice he said two things there. He said, he that hears my sayings and, and. does them. But if he that hears and does not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell in the ruin of that house was great. Amen. So, if I can sum it up in Revelation 14, 12. Three places in the book of Revelation, it uses this combination of describing the children of God. But this, this is one of them. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So if we put all the scriptures up to this point together, what the picture you get is this. You are built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, His sacrifice for us at Calvary, the washing in His blood of our sins, the remitting of our sins. Right. But then we're built upon a solid doctrine, a doctrinal foundation of the prophets of the Old Testament, the apostles of what we call the New Testament, right? And obedience. Mm -hmm. Obedience. Obedience. It's there, guys. Jesus right. said it in several places. That's one. And he said it again in Revelation three times. That's, that's as end of the book as you can get. And I only bring this up because of the next area we're going to. Lately it seems, and for many years in the, in the church, but especially heating up now, there has always been an attack on what we call the Old Testament. And lately there seems to be a push in, in, in some churches, uh, one in particular was in the news, where they were trying to say that the Christians didn't need anything before the book of Matthew. Shouldn't even bother reading it. It was like, 
or something to that effect, right, Elder? Yeah, he didn't try to say do away with the Ten Commandments. So that that is as unscriptural as you can get, and I'm going to prove it here in a second. But this is a dangerous time we live in, and as one of one of two elders put in charge of this body, as uh, to do my job is to make sure I warn the flock not to get caught up in this, this kind of thought Amen. process. Don't Amen. be deceived. Amen. The whole Word of God from Genesis to Revelation chapter 22 is applicable to your life. Amen. Now some parts are applicable as lessons, types and shadows, etc. But all, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for instruction, edification, reproof, and rebuke in righteousness Amen. Amen. and for growth. If it no longer applies, like animal sacrifice, that's fine. There's still a lesson to be learned there. Amen. You don't appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross if you don't understand how much blood was spilled by goats and lambs and bulls by priests, an army of priests an army. that stood watch day and night for the souls of the whole nation of Israel slaying animals right. to push back the wrath of God against one nation. Amen. You don't understand what went on at the, at the rock called Golgotha ah, if you don't understand what went on at a Amen. temple altar. Hallelujah. If you don't understand, and that'll be another lesson, if you don't understand the furniture in the tabernacle, you don't fully understand what Yeshua is in our life and what we are Amen. supposed to have in us. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whew. Bless you, Lord. Can I go off script, Elder? Yeah, you, Guys, I want to encourage you if you go to Exodus 20 later and you read the furnishings, I want you to think and study Exodus 20. God told Moses what to put in there, and later in the chapter, Moses put it in there. And if I can say that it, every, almost every single one of those things is a type and shadow of some aspect of Yeshua's ministry. Amen. And almost every single one of those things applies to something in our life. For example, the altar of the burnt offering. Have you been there? Have you been there in repentance? All right. Have you had his blood? Right. Right. Check. The labor of washing. Have you been baptized? All right. Okay? The menorah in the holy place. Do you let the light of this word shine into your life? All right. And through your life. The showbread on the table is the bread of life from heaven part of your life. Right. The man of the bowl of manna inside the holy of holies, next to the ark, is God our provision. Do we do we eat of the manna that came from heaven? He said, I am that man. All right. Amen. Amen. The commandments that were placed inside the ark, have they been written, inscribed by the Holy Ghost on your heart? All right. Which is your mind in the Hebrew thought process. This is your heart in Hebrew. Okay? Yep. Okay. This moves the blood around your body. <laughs> this is the heart of your being. It's your mind. And that's why I think Jesus said by the renewing of your mind, right? Or, or Paul said about Jesus, be renewed in your mind. Amen. Amen. I can go on and on, but just to give you that, that is, that is something that um, it's so deep when you understand the tabernacle, when you understand the pieces of furniture that were placed in your guys. It's Beautiful. powerful. It's beautiful. Let's go to 2 Timothy 2.15. <clears throat> Paul will back me up a little bit. Love you guys. I hope that uh, this is helping somebody. I hope this is, uh, is is edifying to somebody. It is. Second Timothy chapter two verse fifteen. Paul's instruction to a young elder bishop. I think eventually a bishop. Eventually. Study to show thyself approved. But this doesn't just apply to elders. This applies to every single one of us. Right? If I can just go off topic for just a second. Unto perfection, unto maturity, right? I don't normally talk about, you know, examples from real life in here, but, you know, sometimes it's okay. I just don't want to make it the, the focus. But there's a big game tomorrow for some people that are into football. Is there? Yeah, there's, supposedly there's this thing called a Super Bowl, right? But if I could just use that for example, for just a second, to demonstrate something as an example. 
None of these guys that are going to take the field tomorrow started playing football last week. Right. Right. Okay. You see where I'm going with this? Yep. None of these guys, even if they've been playing since the age of five, just shows up every Sunday and puts on pads and plays and doesn't practice. Right. That's good. You see where I'm going, right? And not everybody on the field has the same job. And I could do it, go on and on and on, but that's a, that's enough. But you guys get the sports analogy, right? You could use the analogy in, the, in, in a restaurant. Not everybody's the ho the hostess at the front, or the, the cooker in the back, the chef in the back, or the, the waitress or waiter that's bringing you food. Everybody's got a role, and they all didn't start working yesterday, right? Or they're in training still, right? And they've got somebody shadowing. My point being this: we're all at different stages in our walk. We got some that have just been baptized. We got some that have were baptized over twenty years ago. All sit in this room. Amen. Okay, and everybody in the middle. It is so important, and I, I'm, I'm, this is for me as much as it's for anybody else in this room, but it is so important, a couple of those things I just brought up, it's important that it's not just something we do once a week. Right. And think we're going to be better than the last game, if you will, using the football analogy. We're not growing, so it has to be daily, practicing and prayer and study. It has to be growth. And we can't expect someone that just got baptized to be on the same level as someone that was baptized 20 years ago. Amen. Right. They've been studying for half a lifetime. <laughs> we must be patient with each other. Right. We also must grow. So again, I'll bring this back because the Bible says that we are ambassadors for Christ. Yes. Now get back in a biblical example. Do you think any president ever sends an ambassador to a foreign country that doesn't know anything about that president's policies. Come on. Come on. Right? So if we're ambassadors for Christ, we've got to grow into that. We become ambassadors by growing in the word and prayer, study, so we can discern good and evil. We have to know. You can't be an ambassador for Christ if you don't know the word. All right. Otherwise, you're not necessarily, you might mess up and Misrepresent him. Right. Ouch. On accident, you know, it just happens. But I'm just saying, we've got to grow, right? If we want to be good ambassadors, right? if we want to be mature ambassadors there for we Christ, go. we have to grow in the word so that we're properly representing our king. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, let's get back on track. Second, uh, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. I know everybody probably has this memorized, but it says, Study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, Ooh. rightly dividing the word of truth. Hallelujah. Not uh -huh. randomly dividing the word of truth. Not finger in the wind dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Yeah. Let's go to uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. So what are the scriptures? Contrary to our the, the pastor that was in the news, <laughs> the Bible's very clear what the word is. And remember, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly, or mainly, because that unto them were committed. The oracles of God. It didn't say they were the oracles of Israel or the oracles of the Jews. Right. They were God's words put on loan to the people of Israel. Amen. To, if they fulfilled their full mission, would have been to share with the world. Right. <clears throat> so this identifies clearly that the oracles of God were given to the Jews. Don't believe me? Psalm 147. I'm going to read verse 15 and verses 19 and 20. Psalm 147, verse 15 says, He sends forth His commandment upon earth. His word runs very swiftly. Verse 19 and 20. He shows His word unto Jacob, His statutes and His judgments unto Israel. He has not dealt so with any nation. And as for His judgments, they have not known them. Hallelujah. The only nation that God ever gave His Word to that you can trust 
is the word he gave to Moses and the prophets. Right. That's it. It's not any other nation's uh, law code, the Hammurabi's no. code, Buddha, all these other isms and stuff. No. The word you can trust is the one that was given to Moses right. and the other prophets. Amen. Yeah. That's it. That's it. And the apostles. And the apostles. They're, they're included. They are Anybody included. misunderstand? They are included. It's included cover to cover. But the foundation and the time that everything we're going to read in the New Testament was written, the scriptures Paul and the other apostles are talking about are the ones from Genesis to Malachi. Amen. Okay? There were no other scriptures they could have been talking about. Right. Okay. However, that doesn't mean we don't need the new. Like another extreme that some of you may run across out there. Be careful on the internet. Some will say you don't need the New Testament. Others say you don't need the Old Testament. Both are in a ditch. If you don't have the New Testament, you don't understand the point of the Old Testament. Right. And if you don't have the Old Testament, the New Testament has no foundation. Right, that's good. You can come up with a million different doctrines in the New Testament if you're not grounded that's in what word. the prophet said. That's a good word right there. Amen? Amen. And if I can go off script, so son, don't move, stay right there. <laughs> go to Amos chapter 3, because this is very important. Because many people will try to say certain things have been done away with that haven't been. Uh, chapter 3, verse 7. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, uh -oh. except He reveals His secret unto His servants, the prophets. Guys, if you don't at least have an inkling or a hint that something the prophets prophesied was a type and shadow of something, right? sorry. Yep. <laughs> it's the word. It isn't so. It's the word. There's certain things you just will not find prophecy for. No matter how hard you look, no matter how hard you twist the verse, flip it inside out, right. it's, guys, it's not there. God said it plainly. If he didn't reveal it to his prophets, it's not a doctrine. Right. He's not going to go change something. That doesn't mean he didn't change the covenant in the terms of the agreement. There is a new covenant. But he didn't change his character. Nope. He never gave any notice to anybody. <laughs> that he was, he was completely doing away with Israel. Or his law. Amen. <laughs> Let's go to Luke chapter 24. Elder, I know this, this one here coming up. This goes hand in hand with one, and I know one of your favorite verses. No one called Jesus Lord saved by the Holy Ghost. I would argue that here we get an example that sometimes when you're when you're trying to witness to somebody or trying to share, don't beat yourself up if they're not getting it. Right. Hey, sometimes it just not, it's not revealed yet. So listen to what happens here. Verse 44, I think, right? And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. Guys, right. if, if Jesus, through the Holy Ghost, has not opened your mind to the Scriptures, just, just keep praying. Amen. Okay. Seek Hang in there. Fun. Seek. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. All right. He goes back. That's the foundation of our whole of the whole gospel of Jesus Christ right there. Let's go to Acts uh, chapter 17, verse 11. How are we doing on time? All right. All right. Okay. It's the Sabbath of the Lord. We're good. Amen. Amen. If you don't have this one circled, you might want to circle it. Never take anything taught to you Come on. for granted yes. that the person studied it all the way out and didn't miss anything. We're all human here. Even I am. Mm -hmm. Even Elder Logan is. Okay? You can all miss. Yep. Okay? Just stay humble about it. You can all... Come back and correct the record later. Verse 11. These, talking about the, the believers that were in the city of Berea. He had just come from Thessalonica, went down to Berea, and I think he went back to Thessalonica or something like that. He said, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, 
whether those things were so. It's everyone's responsibility in this room to basically fact check me, right? Mm -hmm. And anybody else that teaches anything to this to this congregation, to this group, uh, here is, is to go back and study for yourself. Make sure that we didn't go off the rails somewhere and go right. sideways, right? right. <laughs> okay? It can happen to the best of us. Amen. Yeah. But it's a noble thing to search the scriptures. Right. If you ever have a, a preacher that preaches something and you tell them, oh, that was good. I'm going to have to go study a few things. I'm not quite sure I see it. If they, if they get their hair up on end over that, I'd be a little worried. Yep. Okay? And 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, and then the groundwork is laid. And we'll just teach a quick, a quick, uh, quick lesson here. But continue thou in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them. Mm -hmm. And that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, wow. which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture, somebody say all scripture. All, all scripture. scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or mature or complete. Thoroughly furnished, that's the house reference. All right. Right? Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Good works. Amen. Okay? And that draws the final parallel from the beginning there before we move on. We are ordained, if somebody told you different, forget about it. We are ordained for works. Right. right. We're just not ordained for dead works. Right. right. Getting, like we talked about earlier, <laughs> getting baptized is not a dead work. That is a good work. That is. Actually, it's just obedience. It's just, uh, it's being buried in Christ. It's dying to your flesh. That's right. Okay. Uh, another one that, you know, just to give an example, because I don't know everybody's background here, but, you know, some would say, you know, try and say like communion. Oh, that's just a work. You don't need to do that. You just, you know, show up and just love on Jesus. Okay. No, this is, this is a, this is, he said, do this. He did. And Paul, amen. To him. amen. All the apostles, the early church, this was from all I've read, guys, I'm going to say right here, this right here. This was a big, big deal it was. in the early church. Right. Big deal. This communion table was their life. These people that were being burned at the stake and fed to lions, that was their life. <clears throat> Good works. Amen. We won't get into that all today, but yes, there, there are works that were ordained from the beginning of time for us to do once we are in Christ, for him to work through us good works in the earth. All right, so now, I wanted to touch on an aspect of laying on of hands. Okay, the laying on of hands, just so somebody would think I'm crazy. Best I can measure, there's about three what three reasons someone laid their hands. One was uh, the apostles or the disciples or Jesus himself would lay hands on somebody to, to, to pray for healing, lay hands on the sick to pray for healing. I'm not talking about that today. Uh, another one was the laying on of hands for ordination. It's a very real thing for uh, yes, laying on of hands for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, laying on of hands to ordain elders in every city, etc. That's a laying on of hands for a positive transference of authority and power Amen. Uh, in the church and the congregation of the living God. That's the word. Okay. There's a third. And this is one of those examples where if you don't know the Old Testament... You won't have any idea what some of the stuff is talking about. There's a third kind of laying on of hands that had to do with accusing somebody, being a witness. There seems to be in our culture today, be careful that we don't get caught up in it as the church or don't get caught up in it in the church. And that is at the mouth of heresy, not heresy, but hearsay, sorry, hearsay, <laughs> just at some hearsay or one witness ready to stone somebody. All right. It's not biblical, guys. And I'm, the, the scripture is going to prove it out. Amen. Not this guy. Be very careful because there is a, it is a foot in our society to just basically do character assassination on people. Be careful not to pile on without all the facts. 
And I go even further. Right. If it's not your business, just stay out of it anyway. Yes. Amen. Okay. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. I mean, you guys do watch a little news, right? Amen. Okay. And, and so there just seems to be this thing. I think a lot of it came along with, like, the invention of the just the instant, like, the, what do they call that, viral videos. and I mean, yeah. just all kinds of reasons. Maybe 24-hour news cycle, but it just seems to be the latest thing. Maybe it's existed for all time, but it just seems to be more in our face nowadays. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to show you guys. I want to build you guys up today to guard yourself from this particular sin. That can be very easy because it's an emotionally triggered thing. Right. And it can be very easy to pile on, and before you know it, you've got something to repent over. Okay, so let's get into it. Amen. So let's talk about either, we can say it one of two ways, either laying hands of accusation, be very careful about it, or speaking as a witness with your mouth. This is, to me, it's the same thing. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> That, that saying, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, that's a lie, actually. That is a and I, I think I've got that verse in here. I'm going to prove that that's actually a lie. Amen, it is. Words, the power of words, life and death is in the tongue. Right. Yeah. Life and death is in the tongue. You, you talk to the parents, talk to the parents of some kids that have committed suicide because of verbal bullying. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you tell them that words will never hurt me. That's right. Yeah, you didn't go to their funeral that they had to have for that child. A lot of them say the voices. The voices. The words. So we have to be very careful with our words. Amen. Doesn't mean there's not a time to rebuke somebody, yes. but do it in godliness. Yes. Do it the right way. Yes. First Timothy chapter five, verse seventeen through twenty-two. First Timothy chapter five. Now, this is referring to elders, but I'm going to go so far as to say, even your brothers and sisters, you do want to apply this to everybody, right? This kind of admonition here. But it is specifically talking about elders in this case, and that's fine. Some of it applies just to elders. But the principle I'm focusing on applies to everyone. It says, uh, just giving you context, that's, that's the point here. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. And the labor is worthy of his reward. Okay? Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. <clears throat> Them that sin, rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. That's a lot of witnesses. That you observe these things without, and basically prejudice, without prejudice, without favoritism. Right. Without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Right. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Okay. Where am I going with that? Well, I use this scripture, and I, a couple things. One, verse 19 is all I need to teach this. Two or three witnesses. The principle's there. <clears throat> Guys, we're not to take accusations against an elder or anybody else in the church lightly. If you don't have two or three witnesses, right? You know, there's 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 a reason for that. Yeah. Okay. Now, as far as I can study out in verse 22, the laying hands suddenly on no man. Now, how many, before I get into what I think it is. How many people have heard this verse used, especially in Pentecost, as a reason to, when you're praying for people at the altar, to be careful about laying hands on somebody because you didn't want a spirit to jump off of them and on you? <laughs> How many have heard that? <laughs> Guys, I'm sorry. Yeah. There's only two things this is, and that ain't one of them. All right. <laughs> Guys, I'm going to tell you straight, Jesus was not afraid of any devil. No. The apostles were not afraid of any devil. Come on. They weren't afraid to walk up and cast out a devil. Usually, I don't even think they touched them half the time. They just spoke and the devil right, didn't get right. out. Amen. Anybody full of the Holy Ghost, under authority, in covenant and under authority with God Almighty, yes. in the name of Yeshua, yes. Come on, no. the devils are under that. They, they can't, yep. it's, it's over. Yes. So, that completely out of context. That's the reason I read so much of it. Guys, there was nothing in this context, starting at uh, uh, elders worthy of double honor or whatever, nothing in this context has to do with praying for people, casting out devils. It's all about accusations. It's all about two, you know, basically one thing. 
Be careful not to stick your hand in as a false witness. Right. Okay? The only other thing is, uh, I looked in the Geneva Bible study notes and one other place, they also say this could be the laying on of hands of ordination. In other words, don't be so fast to go ordain people as elders until they've been through the test. Okay? And that, that's, that's plausible. Because if you ordain them too quick, and then they don't know what they're doing, or you don't know about their character, next thing you know, there might be some accusations, legitimate ones, with two, three, four, five witnesses. Okay, hence the mess in certain parts of the religious world. Right. Okay, so, so maybe it's that. So either way, the principle holds either on verse 19, it says, don't receive an accusation except at the mouth of two or three witnesses, which means you can bring an accusation against a, a bishop, an elder, or whoever. You just better make sure you do it the right way. Right. And that applies to all saints. Shouldn't be loose with our accusations. Go, Elder. If I could also say this, the when it says not to do that, it's also telling you there's two sides to a story. Yes. And a lot of times people are hearing of this. People come to you, they want to give you, oh, well, he did this to me. Okay, but what did you do? Amen. You get one side of the story, that accusation. You need more than, than one witness. Amen. Amen. So, So I don't want to go out and say one way or the other on that. So I'll just stick with the two or three witnesses. But just bear in mind, I do think that that may have been also talking about what I'm about to show. But regardless, the, the point still stands. There's two things at this point. One is be slow to ordain people. Make sure that they that they they got a, a, a proven, mature walk going before you yeah. make them an elder. Amen. Don't make don't a novice make an elder. Okay. <laughs> and then two is be careful who you start accusing in the church. Especially those that are laboring in the Word. Okay. Amen. Are we good? We got the foundation straight? Yeah. I just wanted to be open and honest because I don't know 100% what that lay hand suddenly means, but I know it doesn't mean worry about devils jumping off of people on you. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. Okay. So we can get rid of that false belief. Uh. It's amazing when you read the Word in context. Yeah. Deuteronomy 17. So let's talk about the principle of two or three witnesses, and let's talk about the laying on of hands, which I I do believe is uh, what Jesus was uh, kneeling down in the sand waiting for people to figure out with the, the accused adulteress. They weren't going about procedure right. They sure weren't. Okay? Uh, at a minimum, they weren't going about procedure right. Deuteronomy 17, verse 2 through 7, to give you the full... A context of this, Moses in the retelling of the law before the children of Israel went into the land, he reiterates this very important principle of God. If there be found among you within any of thy gates, which means in your cities, which the Lord thy God gives thee, man or woman that has wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God in transgressing his covenant and has gone and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun or the moon or any of the host of heaven, Ooh, Lord help us. Okay. Which I have not commanded. Save that for another day, Elder. That's yours. And it and it be told thee. Guys, it's just like they told him like that guy's worshiping weird. It's like that was enough, all right? So it's, and you have heard it, or heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true, and the thing certain. There's some things hidden in that verse, right? Mm -hmm. If you've diligently searched out the matter, is what he's saying. It's basically to the elders and the priests, right? The elders in the cities and the, probably the Levites a little bit there. Basically, make sure you search out the matter. Someone comes to you accusing, search it out. Right. Say, make sure you got your facts straight. But if it's true that such abomination is wrought or worked in Israel, that's a work of the flesh, that's a work unto death, <coughs> a dead work, then shall you bring forth that man or that woman which has committed that wicked thing, Unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shall stone them with stones. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Until they die. Period. Oops, there's another verse. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death and afterward the hands of all the people so thou shalt put the evil away from among you what's the principle 
principle is, if you bring the accusation and you're one of the witnesses, the people that said it so, they're the first ones that have to cast a stone. And when they do that, they are saying that it's the truth. Mm -hmm. And then all the rest of the nation or the people of that city followed in suit. It's a very dangerous thing to do if you're doing it as a false witness. And you'll see why in a second. That's the principle of the laying on of hands. It's the, you're guilty, and now I'm going to stone you right. and remove the wickedness from the nation. Right. That was the principle. Two or three witnesses search out the matter, verify the facts, and when it's done, the people that said it is true are the first people that have to execute the judgment. Amen. And they put their hand to it. Think about it. And basically in American society, it's going to be like the shaking of the hands. Like I would say back before, uh, well, let's say the John Wayne era. I don't know that shaking hands means much today. But back when it meant something, it'd be like the shaking of the hand. It's true. I promise. And then throwing rocks. Right. Okay? This is serious stuff, guys. Amen. So right away, without going any further, we see exactly where Paul got the reference for about receiving not an accusation against an elder except at the mouth of two or three witnesses. Do you notice that without the book of Deuteronomy, do you understand that you don't know what Paul's talking about? Right. If you don't understand this right here. But if you do understand it, then you understand the reason why Paul brought it up. Right. Because you're, you're spiritually killing that elder. If you're bringing an accusation against them, he's done. Right? So you got to make sure it's true. Right. Okay. Moving on for the sake of time. Exodus 23, verses 1 and 2. Exodus 23, verse 1 and 2. This is the admonition to us. Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Uh -oh. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean we should. Right. Right. Do not follow the multitude to do evil, neither shall you speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. I think that he's like to rest away judgment um, by being a false witness. How does this build? Well, it builds on, this is where I think that, that Paul could be referring to, he says, lay hands on no man suddenly, be partakers of their evil deeds. And that's where I kind of feel that it may be that, is because in verse uh, 2 there, or sorry, in verse, uh, uh, verse 1, the second half of verse 1, put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness, Right? Because you're basically putting your hand in with their wickedness by right. being quick to, to, to be that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that, that's, but either way, it doesn't matter. It's still the, the principles there. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15 through 19. Deuteronomy 19. <clears throat> One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity. Say, for any iniquity. Any iniquity. <laughs> God says one witness is not enough. I'm sorry, guys. Or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. If a false witness, get this, guys, hear me. This is what I was talking about at the beginning of this section. This is why it's so important that we try to check ourselves and not get caught up in the modern world's uh, rush to judgment every time some, something comes out. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and has testified falsely against his brother, then shall you do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother, so shalt thou put the evil away from among you. Mm -hmm. How many know that David had many sins? Mm -hmm. How many know the Lord called one an abomination? Mm -hmm. Not that the others weren't wrong. But he specifically calls one out by name. 
He calls it the matter, matter of Uriah the Hittite. Mm. We're going to see why in a second. I want you to bear that in mind. And uh, just another side note, in the Ten Commandments, a little clarification, and I'm not saying it's okay to lie, but the bigger point of thou shalt not bear false witness, which is when we say thou shalt not lie, and we try to tell our kids, well, tell me the truth, did you get a cookie out of the cookie jar? Well, this is what it's talking about. Right. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. That is what it's talking about. Okay? That's the main thing it's talking about. People died for that sin, or for breaking that commandment. Bearing false witness against a neighbor got people killed, right. or they had to, if they were, you know, lying, like say about stealing, they had to repay, like I think was it four times restitution. I mean, yeah. Because so, I mean, guys, this is a big deal if you falsely accuse somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what that commandment's talking about at the heart of it. Okay. Matthew eighteen fifteen through seventeen. Matthew eighteen. Now, Jesus brings clarification to the process by which we are to um, confront, if you will, or try to correct our brothers and sisters. Okay, and This is helpful because we're not under the, uh, the stoning type penalties. We're not under that, that part of the covenant. But the principle applies, and let's see how Jesus said to handle it. Moreover, in verse 15, if thy brother shall trespass against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Mm -hmm. Try and handle it one on one. <clears throat> if he will hear you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, then take with you one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. It doesn't sound like right here that Jesus is doing away with any principle of the law of God. No. <laughs> Sounds like he's reinforcing it Amen. and how we're supposed to use it today righteously. Right. And in um, verse 16, but if he will, uh, yeah, verse 17, and if he shall neglect to hear them, then tell it unto the church. But if you neglect to hear the whole church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Could you imagine, like, bringing somebody up here after doing the other two parts and, like, in front of the whole church, having the whole church telling somebody they need to stream? <laughs> Woo! That, man, that's brutal, Elder. That's brutal. You'd hope it'd be handled, you know, one of the first two steps. But that's, uh, that's the words of our, our Savior. But notice he does say to try and handle it one-on-one. One-on-one. -on -one. We used to call that in the Air Force, uh, taking care of things at the lowest level. Delegation of authority down to the lowest level. Okay, instead of getting everybody and a commander and everybody involved, just, you know, just go handle it. If you can handle it without the commander knowing everybody's better. Amen. All right. <laughs> Proverbs 6.16. Proverbs 6.16. Son, can you still quote this one? I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> Proverbs, if you don't have these circled in red, Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. It's very curious, the things, it's not really, the things that God puts in this passage. <clears throat> and we're almost done. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devise wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that sows discord among the brethren. Wow. Man. Starting from the back, we're way up. We talked about the discord, and that's in the one in Corinthians, right, Elder? About the whole, I'm, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, mm -hmm. that's the discord. Uh, discord. Yep. Um, the false witness we've talked about all day. But, I mean, almost all of those have to do with getting involved in things yep. quickly, running in, just rushing in. And look at that. And then they, this is what I was talking about with David. In the matter of Uriah the Hittite, what did he do? He made the man carry his own letter, basically own death warrant, and have been up to the commander to put him in front of battle, right? right. He killed an innocent man. So that's the shed innocent blood thing. It's crazy. But David repented, right? And at least he didn't kill the prophets like so many other kings did when the prophet confronted them. Mm -hmm. mm. Proverbs 10, we're going to wrap up now and show how it's not just about physically putting your hands on somebody, but it's also going to be spoken with your mouth. 
And so I already split, while everybody is going to Proverbs chapter 10, so just to kind of go over what um, the case of the adulterous woman and everything we've learned today, if you can take that situation and think about it. The law says if a man and woman are caught in the act, you know, you, you have both of them be put to death. They only brought the woman. And apparently he started asking for witnesses when he says he that was out sin cast the first stone. That's basically, okay, because the first people that are supposed to cast stones were those that witnessed it. Right. And everybody just started turning away. But they knew. They knew the word I just read. They knew that if they were caught being a false witness, the same would happen to them. All right. Okay? So guys, this starts to make a lot more sense when you understand the magnitude of what Jesus was asking them to do. Right. He's saying, all right, he that's without sin cast the first stone. Well, the first stone was always cast by the witnesses, and they already had messed up. They said they caught him in the very act. Right. They didn't have a man there. I don't know how he slipped out the back door. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> then they apparently had no witnesses, because he said, where are your accusers? He was faster. Ain't none. Team. <laughs> but then the rest of the church forgets the last thing he said, which was go and sin no more. Right? right. So there's a lot of sinning going on there. And some people that almost sinned, but Jesus stopped them by putting them on the spot. Yeah, really. Proverbs 10 18. He that hides hatred with lying lips, and he that utters slander is a fool. Wow. In the multitude of words, there lacks not, so that's what that word wanted means in the King James, if I can bring that to modern English. Basically, if you talk a lot, you don't lack sin. Because if you talk a lot, you're going to say something you didn't mean to say. <laughs> so if I can just put that plain English. Okay, I'm going to get it out of the Shakespearean for a second for you. Uh, if you talk a lot, there's not going to be a lack of sin coming out of your mouth. That's what it says. But he that refrains his lips is wise. I gotta be really careful because I talk a lot. <laughs> you guys know that. Yeah. Woo. Man. He's done. Amen. That was your chance to say. Sometimes, it, <laughs> so, sometimes the gift of gad is like right there. It's like, hey, be careful. So think before you speak comes to mind. Pray right? for Franna. Pray for, for my wife. Most of the time, that's probably how I get myself in the doghouse. I probably should have stopped about three sentences ago. <laughs> Right, baby? Yep. All right. Thank you. Let's go to Proverbs 26. You know, we'll wrap up with two beautiful passages. Just put, the, put it all, all the way. Proverbs 26, verses 17 through 25. Yes, I know this is, uh, this is a tough word, but I think it's good. Yes. It puts us on guard against our own worst nature. Yes. You ain't kidding. Okay? 26, 17. He that passes by and meddleth with strife belonging not to him. Woo! If it ain't your business, stay out. Keep it moving. Just, woo, I didn't see that. I mean, I know sometimes when someone's kid's acting out, you want to walk over there and get involved. You ain't kidding. It ain't your business. Stay out. All right, anyway. 26, 17. He that passes by and meddles with strife belonging not to him is like one that takes a dog by the ears. Now, I don't know what taking a dog by the ears is, but I'm assuming if you grab a dog by the ear, you're liable to get a snap on the wrist. Yeah. I don't know. Elder, how does that work? If you grab the dog by the ears, he turn around and bite you? I think that's probably what happens. Otherwise, I don't think they would have used that. Um, as a madman who casts firebrands, arrows, and death, uh, so is the man that deceives his neighbor and says, am not I joking over that? I was just joking. Okay. Where no wood is, there the fire goes out. What's that have to do with what I'm talking about? Read the rest of the verse. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceases. All right. Man. <laughs> Tell me this doesn't apply today. Listen up, ladies. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm a, since I'm up here, I have, I have to I have to lightly admonish the elder. It ain't just the women that have a problem with the, the tail bearer. They say women say 10,000 more words a day than men on average. <laughs> All right. Maybe, maybe they have more opportunities, but we're just as bad. All right. I'm messing up. All right, so let's read that verse again. Where no wood is, the fire goes out. So, where there's no gossip, the strife ends. Right? All right. Okay. So, 
Someone ever calls us up, and I'm including myself in this, someone calls us up, let's do our level best. If they're talking about somebody, hang up the phone and let it die with you. Don't play submarine and keep passing that around the church. Amen. Okay? Amen. Amen. I know that's hard. I know. Honestly, sometimes it, it just doesn't even need to be shared. Just, right. just squash it. If it's something you think needs prayed about, go pray about it by yourself. Amen. But, man, be careful. Amen. Be careful. Yes. Thank you, Lord. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is the contentious man to kindle strife. Man, they live on Facebook. <laughs> the words of a tail bearer are as wounds. That old sticks and stones thing is what I'm talking about right here. Solomon was the wisest next to Yeshua to ever walk the earth. That's the truth. Okay, second wisest man to ever walk this planet. And he's telling you that words do hurt and they do break bones. So listen to him. He says the words of a tail bearer, a gossiper, are as wounds and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. That's like down deep. They hurt. Okay. Jesus. Amen. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot shard covered with silver dross. That's all the waste, basically. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips. He disguises it and lays up deceit within him. When he speaks fair, he speaks like, you know, nicely, fair words. Believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Uh-oh. We read those abominations. And this, this right here if you take it in context, is summing up what those seven abominations were. Shift to sweat, uh, swift to shed innocent blood, lying tongue, etc., etc. Though The word doesn't lie, people. It lines up very nicely. Amen. And sometimes it's a hard one. It steps on our toes. And that's okay. <clears throat> Proper, uh, so we're going to end with Psalm 15, and then James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. Psalm 15. I just want to read the whole thing so you have the whole context and you'll see the parts that uh, drive it home. Lord, who shall abide in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And today, who is his tabernacle? We are. Amen. So we want his spirit to be able to dwell in us. That's right. Okay, so we can dwell in his presence, if you will. Kind of two-way street now. He that walks uprightly and works righteousness, and speaks the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, false witness, right? Nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that swears to his own hurt. That's talking about if you take an oath, and you didn't think about it all the way through, and now you got to follow through, you follow through even if it hurts you, financially or whatever, right? You're a man of your word or a woman of your word. And he changes not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, that means absurd interest. In other words, like uh, sharks, payday, uh, payday loan sharks, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That'd be like a practice. That, that's what that's talking about. It's like exorbitant interest type stuff. Puts not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. In other words, he's not going to take a bribe against an innocent man. That's good. He does these things. He that does these things shall never be moved. In other words, we become like a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. We shoot our roots down deep in God's word, and we will not be shaken if we avoid all the stuff before that last verse. Does that make sense? Amen. And then let's read James which has got like half an epistle on the tongue. James 1, verses 19 to 27. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, but slow to speak, and slow to wrath. It means slow down. Take it all in. Don't be so fast to just go talking. For the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and abundance of naughtiness and receive with meekness, humility, etc. The engrafted word, this right here, which is able to save your souls. All right. 
You know, I think in Timothy he said, uh, from a youth you have known the scriptures, is able to make you wise unto salvation. Guys, this, this word, the whole word of God, is able to make us wise, both unto salvation and unto a fruitful walk with God. Yeah. I can add that. Yes, <clears throat> But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholds himself, and then goeth his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. Let's not forget that we're in Christ, and Christ is in us after we leave every Sabbath. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's kind of what he said. Right? But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty, and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, the good works, guys, right. this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain, worthless, a lie, whatever you want right. to plug in there. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep him, himself unspotted from the world. Amen. So in closing, let us be careful. The world is going crazy. Nuts. With false accusations, quick accusations, baseless accusations, who sometimes, within 24 hours, are debunked when the whole story gets out. As children of God and of the Most High, let us not get caught up in the sins of the world. Amen. Amen. Let us not get caught up. Let us be careful before we share that thing on Facebook and then the next day have to repent. <laughs> this is easy. We've all done it. Okay? Or we've all come close to doing it. Let's not lie to ourselves. Let's all take a deep breath as children of God. Let the news sort itself out before we jump in piling on. Okay? Let's just let things work. Amen. And let's focus on this. Let's focus on the word. Let's just pray for somebody. Pray for the situation. Let's further the kingdom. Amen. Okay? Amen. 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 Let's look, give the Lord a hand clap and pray. Yeah. Yeah. Elder. Hey, John, my friend. Yeah. Praise the Lord. You know, I want to go back to a, a verse he pulled up. Uh, Psalm 15. Psalm 15. Yes, sir. It was Psalm 15. Uh, he that walks up rightly. Uh, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in the holy hill? They that walk uprightly, work righteousness, speak the truth, holds back his tongue from backbiting, does evil to his neighbor, or takes up a reproach to his neighbor. All of this, what the Lord is trying to establish, and we talked about this character. We're, we're schooling for ruling, we're training for reigning. Right? Amen, that's it. His kingdom is coming here. We shall reign as kings and priests with, with the Lord. Him. That's right. God is looking for our righteous government. Yes. That's right. Not Democrats, not Republicans. Amen. I'm going to be honest with you. They've taken bribes, both sides, yes. right. against them, and, and have shed blood against innocent. Neither parties, you know, none of them are innocent. Amen. This, God is trying to establish fear in us, righteousness yes. in us, Amen. so that we ain't taking bribes, yes. so that we are judging righteous judgment. Right. Amen. When these cases are brought before us, I love it how Jethro put Moses on to it. He said, Chief, you're trying to take all these matters. Amen. You kill yourself. You're going from the morning to the evening. You need to dish that out. Amen. Type in shadow. Dish it out to the people of God. You do it right. And that's what the Lord's trying to establish. Amen. So when homegirl calls you up, girl, did you hear what she did? No. Uh, listen, I, 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 Audrey, I need to think. <coughs> homeboy. Oh, homeboy. Homeboy. No, All right. All right. If homeboy calls you up. <laughs> <laughs> Right? God's trying to establish righteousness in us. Okay, folks. And this tongue is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. The Bible says that no man can tame. But if we give it to God and say less words, Brad. <laughs> you weren't talking about the sermon, right? <laughs> it's not talking about people that yet. Yeah. It's talking about people that are too busy on the phone and everybody else's business. That's what it's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So let's take this word to heart. Yes. That was a great word. Folks, that was a great word. Yes. Amen. Amen.